Hey guys, welcome to another one of those what the heck are we doing at Minnesota Implement videos. Uh, this time I actually shut down the shop to shoot this video so maybe you can hear me better. Uh, the last one uh, with everybody welding and grinding and everything, uh, it got a little hard to hear what was going on. Um, so hopefully this is a little better for you to be able to hear what I'm talking about and what's going on. Uh, what I'm doing here is surfacing uh, these UHMW wear blocks that we use in some of our equipment. So these come in as a raw material and it's, uh, it's three quarter of an inch nominal. So it can end up being 10 to 20 thousandths thicker or 10 to 20 thousandths thinner. Uh, because we're doing this as a box tube on box tube slider, the box tube itself also has some randomness to it. So. We always make these parts and then build the equipment and then we shave these to fit so that we get a decent fit on the equipment uh, before we assemble it for final assembly. So when I'm doing these, um, I always make a steel jig that can go into the vise of the mill. And then we also use this when, with the magnetic drill for drilling the actual parts, the steel parts for our units. That way, even though you've got a DRO on the mill, um, if your math is off at all, it can make for a nightmare later on. But if you make this jig for the mill and then just use your DRO to eyeball on your holes, when you use this with the mag drill to drill the piece, everything always matches. It also means that, like in this case, you can see I've got these pocketed holes here. So I had to drill the hole for the quarter inch bolt, then I had to countersink them. Yes, I know there are countersink bits available that will drill the hole and countersink at the same time. I don't happen to have one for this size screw right now, so I had to do it as a two-step process. Well, with that, that means that I can put this piece in, drill the hole, drill all eight of my sliders on this hole, then take it out, put it in, drill all of this hole, take it out, put it in, drill all of that hole. So I can do that step, each hole individually, taking the part out and putting it back in. It saves me a lot of time from having to move the bed of the machine. So if I had a hundred of this part, I drill this one hole a hundred times, then I countersink this hole a hundred times, then I move down to the next hole. It means I don't have to keep moving the bed. Um, so it saves you a lot of time in your processing. Well, the step that I'm at in the process now is that, as I say, I'm shaving these from, I believe these come in at 765 right now, uh, and I need to take them down to 680 or 680, 680, uh, 680, 690, somewhere in there for clearance. So I'm taking right around 100 thousandths off of the thickness of this. Um, so what I'm using is a fly cutter that I made. It's just a single arm fly cutter that I'm using a lathe tool in. Now on soft material, you can use a single arm fly cutter like this and it works real well. Uh, when you're using the, uh, fly cutters on steel or even aluminum, you want a multi-head fly cutter like that. Um, Fly cutters come in any number of configurations. Uh, you can see these things up to 10, 12 inch diameter. You'd never want to run one that big in a J-head mill like this because the mill just won't put up with the hammering or vibration real well. But I have seen people do it for shaving heads or something. You're only taking a thousandths at a time, let's say. Um, but like I say, there's just two different configurations. These go right into your R8 collet. Um, so these are, you know, three inch, two inch uh, diameter fly cutters here. Uh, because I'm working off the center, I'm taking about a five inch wide pass. Um, but like I say, this is the exact same process that you would see if you were surfacing a head or surfacing the top of an engine block. Uh, it's just a fly cutter um, in the mill. But I'll go ahead and get this bolted in. And like I say, in this particular case now, the holes that I had uh, drilled and countersunk now become my hold downs for fly cutting this. And so I just go ahead and put the bolts in the holes. Um, you always want to put as many bolts as you can into your piece. Now the real trick when you're working with a fly cutter 
is you need to make sure that your surface is absolutely flat and even to your bed and that your head on your mill is absolutely square. Because if this was out of square, if this was leaning a little bit, it'll leave a half moon rather than a flat surface cut. So, and then you also, anytime you can, you want to cut with your cutter moving into the material. And what I mean by that is this tip right here that we can see facing you is turning clockwise. And so it's cutting into the edge of the material and then off. And so when I make this pass this way, it's cutting into the material and off the edge as I pass this way. Then I'll move the bed the other way and it's cutting into the material and off. Now on plastic, it's not gonna make a whole lot of difference of whether you're pushing or pulling on your cutter. But when you get into cutting on steel or aluminum or something that's got more body to it, if you're pulling away from the material, any slop that you have in your bed, because you can't have your bed lock set, you always wanna have the bed lock set for the direction that you're not using or not in motion on. But because your other bed lock for travel has to be loose, if you've got any slop in your screw or any slop in your bed, the bed's gonna vibrate and bounce. And first of all, it's gonna make for a lousy cut. Second of all, if it bounces enough, it'll break your cutter. So you always wanna cut into the material so that it keeps tension against your bed screw. So just a couple of little tricks. Now the faster you run, the worse of a cut you're gonna get. So in this case, like I say, I'm taking about a hundred thousandths cut and I'm moving fairly fast because it's plastic and because I don't care if I end up with a little bit of chop in my bed. But if this was a head, I'd only take maybe five to 10 thousandths cut at a time and I'd be running coolant on it and I'd be moving really, really slow. Because the slower you move, the cleaner of a cut you get. Again, one thing you would never want to do on a head or a critical machine part would be stop in the process because your rate of feed across it is going to dictate how smooth your cut is. So if you stop, that cutter is hitting the same place about four or five times, it's going to make a divot or a valley there. So in a critical cut, you would absolutely want to maintain a perfect pace all the way through the process. On this, I don't care if it ends up with a little bit of chop because it's a plastic part and it's just a slider and I'm doing this for clearance anyways. Now the other thing you'll see is notice how you can't see the cutter there because it's spinning, it's in motion. This is where a lot of people get themselves in trouble. Notice all this debris coming off of there. Human nature is you want to clear that debris away from the cutter. And your mind tells you there's nothing there. There's no reason I can't put my hand there. The reality is the reason you can't put your hand there is this thing will take your fingers off. Um, if it can cut plastic and it can cut metal, it sure as heck can take these things off of your hand real quick. So you always want to just, if it's in motion, you don't go near it. That plastic can do what it's going to do, even if that plastic gets wrapped around the cutter and rips my water chip, my water mister system off of here or whatever. That water mister cost me 50 bucks to replace, a hand of 50,000 or more, uh, assuming that you can actually have it reattached. So, not trying to be gruesome or anything, but this type of equipment has no forgiveness when it comes to fleshy things, and these aren't replaceable. The equipment is. Now 
hear a lot of people that, uh, well, I've been running this stuff 30 years, I'm not going to make any blah, blah, blah mistakes, blah, 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 yeah. You know who ends up getting injured the most other than young users who are new to it? Old users who are casual and don't care or don't think about it anymore. Somebody walks in the room, starts a conversation with you, you turn around and forget that the machine was running and go to set your soda down or go to reach for that wrench right now that's under my tooling. And uh, yeah, there, it, it just takes a millisecond to make a life-changing event happen. And yes, they do make power bed feed for this. I even have a power bed feed in a box somewhere. I haven't had time to put it onto this machine. And this machine has less slop in its bed than the other one, hence why I'm using it. But to, you could put the air on here blowing on the cutter, and sometimes I do that. First of all, it helps push the chips away from you, and second of all, it helps keep the tool cooler so that your plastic doesn't end up melting to the tips. I'm not feeding the bed through fast enough where I need to worry about that, but uh, that's all there is to that. That took a hundred thousandths off. Now, I like to keep a knife handy and deburr when it's in the jig because it's a lot easier than chasing the thing with it in your lap or in your hands. But uh, that's cleaning up or uh, uh, surfacing down UHMW plastic with a fly cutter. Um, like I say, it is the same process as you would do for a head or for, uh, you know, surfacing a, a, a interior wall of a hydraulic pump or anything like that. Anytime you need to take some surface off of anything, whether it be steel, plastic, aluminum, uh, you would use a fly cutter for that if you don't have a surface grinder. So that would be the other piece of equipment. But plastic and a surface grinder tends to make a real mess. Um, so anyways, like I say, that's a fly cutter on a Bridgeport mill. We're Minnesota Implement, and thank you very much for watching. Be careful when you're running this stuff. The machinery does not have any forgiveness. It'll remove your fingers or any other body part quicker than you can say, ow. Thanks for watching.